Um, yes, hi. Thank you, everybody, for waiting a little bit. <laughs> Sorry that took a little bit longer. Um, my name is Mercedes. On behalf of everyone with an, an unusual or um, difficult to spell name, thank you for attending my talk today. Um, so I do data infrastructure as my day job, um, like pretty much do anything interested in data systems. And um, I'll tell you the story of kind of how I came to learn how to use and got interested in phonetic algorithms. Um, a little bit about just why I'm interested in this stuff is I grew up really interested, involved in books and libraries, learned how to use the Dewey Decimal System and the um, interlibrary loans when I was a kid. So search is like in my blood. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting to me. So what I'm going to cover today, I'm going to talk a little bit about search, um, just general high level overview of what it is, how does it work. Um, I'm not going to go into super in depth about that because there is a lot of information on search. Uh, talk about phonetic algorithms, what they are, um, and then I'll talk about why you would want to use them. Um, disclaimer, I'm not a linguist. Uh, I just have an interest in this stuff, so um, I might get some things wrong. Uh, feel free to gently correct me at the end of the talk or ask questions if you have them. Um, so when we think of search, we think about the, the massive Googleplex. Um, <laughs> so when you, when you um, misspell a word, it suggests something to you. Um, that might not always be what you're looking for. Um, sometimes Google gets it wrong because they have a massive, massive index of, of things. Um, there are also many different types of spellings in different languages. So sometimes when you misspell something, it could actually be a word in some other language. You're like, what is all this Spanish? I don't know, I, I don't know Spanish. I don't know what these results mean. So it's kind of entertaining sometimes <laughs> to get uh, different results. Um, so Google search works on basically indexing pages um, based on inbound and, out, and outbound links and um, gi gives uh, each page a, a page rank importance. If you've done any sort of like big data um, work or um, studied any of it, you, you've heard about page rank algorithms. That's basically what it does. It doesn't exactly look at the content of the page. For some, to there's there's a lot of like voodoo and black magic in terms of like how. Google actually works. Um, so they may be doing some content analysis on those pages, but I don't actually know that. And for the most part, the search results that we get returned um, indicate that they're not doing that a whole lot. So um, yes, big data, hand wavy comment here. Um, they have massive, massive caches and, and systems. Um, they open, they were kind of the instigators in open sourcing Hadoop. So a lot of that, a lot of that information that we get from Google comes from basically any, any sort of big data thing. So um, so let's step down to the database level and talk a little bit about um, the basic of search as it relates to SQL and NoSQL and those types of things. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about text-based search and um, how, how that kind of works. Uh, uh, the intro to kind of how I stumbled across using phonetic algorithms is that I um, work I volunteer for a very large anime convention every year, and it's about 35,000 attendees. I uh, we'll talked to somebody and said, hey, I'm a software developer. You guys do the lost and found department. Um, they do everything by hand, and they collect about, they probably collect between one and 2,000 items um, every weekend that they run the convention. That's a lot of, a lot of paperwork, so I decided to try and optimize this for them. Um, they also collect a lot of names and um, email addresses and things of that nature just so they can contact people to get their stuff back to them. Um, so I started building this database and looking at ways that the people could search for and enter this information. Um, so it kind of looked at SQL. Um, there's the, the like operator, which is pretty, pretty basic. It's, it's, it's basically a wildcard search. So um, it only returns data that contains the search string. So if you have... Um, something that is not preceded by or not after, like if it, it doesn't actually like match partials of that, that search string, it'll match the, if um, it has, let's see, let me go to my next slide, it'd be a little, a little more easy to explain this. So I have a table of I think about nine words um, that uh, some of them have, there's a, a number of them that contain the search string and um, if we had an entire dictionary's worth of words that contained all this and we wanted to search for a substring, anything that contained and, um, this would get pretty expensive over time. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, I had nine, nine results. <clears throat> so I had nine uh, instances is, of, of words in my database and I searched for it using the wildcard. I got seven, so that's a pretty big percentage of returns on that. If I had a dictionary's worth of words, that would take a very, very long time. 
Um, another database that I looked at and have used extensively um, at my day job is something called Elasticsearch. Um, and this is a database that's built, on, built for search. Um, it's built to basically do full text search. So um, this is pretty neat. What it does is it tokenizes a sentence um, and takes, so we have the, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. So it, it takes out the common words, like the, appears a couple of times, um, and it will uh, assign that a ranking, saying that, that, yeah, this is an important word because it, it comes up really frequently. But it's also, I believe it might decrease that ranking a little bit because it's, it's a common word in English. It shows up a lot. So you can um, search also for partials on this. Notice jump, jumped is turned into jump. Um, so that's, that's a root word. Um, this allows it to quickly, basically, index and um, gives better search performance if you're looking for text. Um, the only thing is if you misspell something um, or have a partial that isn't matched, it's not going to return any results. So it doesn't work so, so well for things like names that are spelled differently if you want to uh, turn on different, um, if you want to match uh, differently, different versions of similarly pronounced names um, or return things like spelling. Like if you're doing any sorts of uh, um, spell check corrector type things, it, it won't work for that. So example, um, Sean versus Sean. These are pronounced the same in English. Um, they are spelled very differently. Um, a text-based search isn't really going to work well for that. So enter phonemes. So this is a, if you're a child of the 80s, you might have re rec remembered um, <laughs> Hooked on phonics, yes, I, I could see that you do. Um, so I just snuck that in there. But reductively, the individual components of, and sounds of words um, that make up a, a particular word are um, what a phoneme is. So different languages have different phonemes according to um, different ways that consonants are pronounced, in com like in combination, or vowels are pronounced. Um, as an example, this is the phonetic chart for English language. I think there's 44 phonemes. Um, I'm not going to bother to go over all of them because there, there's a lot of them. And um, we don't necessarily use this in programming, but it's just kind of interesting to look at. There are different representations for these things. And there are phonetic charts for many different languages. So how do we translate phonemes to code? Um, side note, when I was actually looking up, up this stuff, uh, <laughs> found that uh, a phonetic mouth chart was uh, something that was really common, and it's actually used a lot in animation. So animators use uh, f phonemes to basically make, make it so that uh, the characters that they're animating um, look like they're saying words correctly. So it's funny. It's also interesting if you watch something like anime and you, you look at how they're speaking the words, it's kind of similar, but it just doesn't match up with English very well, so, which is why I prefer to you know, watch it in Japanese. So a phonetic algorithm is a method of hashing words and names based on sound. So this is uh, going to basically make things a bit more efficient um, in the long run, and I'll, I'll kind of get to why, um, and also make your search results more accurate. So uh, there are a number of different types, uh, and these are, these are just the algorithms, not necessarily the implementation, so I'll point that out. Is, um, there are many, many different implementations based upon these algorithms. Um, I'm mostly going to focus on the first three because they're the most common. Um, they're, and they're also in the language that I know, which is English. Um, and um, I'll kind of touch on the last couple uh, as well. But these are, uh, those are implementations based for other languages based, that are not English. So Soundex. Um, this is kind of interesting. I didn't know initially when I, when I went to research this, this that it was developed in the 1900s for census data. So this is basically human computers. Um, uh, they were uh, cat cataloging and um, encoding US names um, to be, so I, I, you know, to do census things, that's a whole field I don't really know a whole lot about. But um, so it was built, built off that in the 1900s. Um, because it's so old and it's been around for so long, it's actually built into Postgres and SQL. So that was kind of neat. I was like, OK, cool. I can actually like, get up and running with these things. Um, the, if you have, like, 
a use case for you. If you have a bunch of names in a database and you do need to generate a bunch of um, phonetic hashes for them, you could do this pretty easily by generating um, a table, a lookup table based on this using SQL and Postgres that's, that's already existing in your database. So it's pretty low level work if you wanted to try out doing something, something like this and already have um, a database of that type. Um, so this is kind of the high level of what the SoundX algorithm is. Um, using my name as an example, capitalizes all of the letters um, and drops all the punctuation marks if there are any. Um, I'm not 100% sure about accent marks with this particular algorithm. Um, the implementation that I'm looking at here too is the, uh, one of the Python libraries, which I'll, I'll uh, make a note as to what that is later on in the talk. Um, retain the first letter of the word. So in SoundX, the first letter is always going to be important. Um, no matter what it is, even similarly, uh, similar consonants are going to be um, uh, not going to be, I guess, uh, swapped or, or um, used. They're always going to be individual. Um, it uses a map, basically, of uh, uh, number zero through six um, to change vowels and consonants to a numerical representation. So um, after that translation, it's my name is M062032. Welcome to my new number, overlords. Um, and then we drop all of the zeros, because the zeros are not important. Um, so it's M6232. Um, finally, what we do is truncate it to four characters. Uh, your your end-level soundex is always going to be four characters. So soundex representation of my name is M623. So um, that's pretty cool. What are some limitations of SoundX? Um, they were developed for English language, so most of the implementations that I've kind of seen only work for the, the English language. Um, so probably not going to work for dialects of Chinese. Um, there, is, there is an implementation of Indian, but I don't know what dialect it's in or if that actually matters, because like I said, I'm not a linguist or a language expert, so um, don't hold me to that. Um, SoundX treats the first letter as an absolute. So what that means is that any, anybody with a C or a K beginning name, those are going to be treated as two different names, but functionally, Clara and Clara sound exactly the same. So if you're trying to do matching or grouping based on name similarities um, with Cs and Ks, that wouldn't work so well. So this was also entertaining. Um, Postgres SoundX has a limited character code encoding support. So if you have a lot of stuff that, that's Unicode or UTF-8, um, any characters that are not ASCII, that's probably going to wreak havoc on your database, so I actually wouldn't recommend using it. Um, so Nysys, this is a, the next algorithm I'm gonna talk about, is um, an improvement upon SoundX. Um, also developed um, in the United States for, for name searches, um, but this was part of the New York State Identification and Intelligence System, which is now, I believe, um, New York State criminal something. I can't exactly remember what it is, but basically what I'm assuming that they're doing here is, is um, looking at names for people that are in the criminal system and grouping and, and doing things of that nature, hashing based on that information. So. It has a bit of a bit better matching um, based on phonemes. So Clara and Clara are the same phonetically. Um, also, I don't know if I mentioned that before, but the the soundex. I think if I have it in my previous slide, yes, Jessica and Joshua. And whoops. Yeah, Jessica and Joshua are um, the same phonetically, according to soundex, which is not exactly true. So um, in the nicest algorithm, they are different. So that, that is going to improve your, your hits significantly. Um, I'm not gonna go through this, but this is the wall of text for the, the, the basics of the nicest algorithm. Um, but uh, kind of the, the as, as you'll notice as looking through more, more of the, the algorithms as they've been developed, they kind of just get more complicated. So um, there's a set of rules. Uh, and I'll kind of touch on it a little bit later, but um, let's see. So going through this with my name, we'll see how this is a little bit different. Um, so according to the algorithm, all instances of the letter E are encoded to A. Um, the trailing S is dropped. So, and then finally, the key is truncated to six characters. 
Um, so also notice in this, there's no uh, mapping for uh, numbers to, to, to letters here. They're just, just using letter representations. Um, so this is a little bit more true phonetically to what things would sound like. Um, and here's just uh, some examples of some other things I tried out. So what I noticed um, is that it's, it, it, the, the initial implementation when I was reading about the algorithm said that it did use Hispanic names for um, some of the phonetics. Um, to, to, it was based off of that, but I tried it out and I don't necessarily see that it works because the X sound and, and J sound is, is more like an H in, in Spanish. So, you know, those, things should be phonetically similar, but they're not. So I'm gonna say this, this is still one of those algorithms that's pretty much just for English usage. Um, and the next one I'm gonna talk about uh, is Metaphone. So this was developed in 1990, again, as an improvement on SoundX and Nysis. There have actually been three implementations of it. Um, double Metaphone is the most common version of Metaphone that I've seen in, in libraries. Um, but there's a double metaphone implements a primary and secondary hash for each word uh, so that you can actually have some similarities between names. So this, this might be useful for you if you're trying to do some research on names and how the spellings have changed over the years or um, do some sort of data analysis on that um, and to see like what's popular, what different variations there are. So you can actually find that information. Um, Catherine and Katerina are two separate names, but they, they have um, a uh, phonetic hash in common. So, uh, secondary matches are not always returned also. There might not be one. In the case of my name, I only have one, so. Um, interesting thing that I noted was Metaphone 3 was closed source, which is probably why I couldn't find um, easily uh, open source library for it, so boo. <laughs> um, all right, so. Now I'm kind of gonna talk about phonetic algorithms and practice and go into a little more detail on how I've actually implemented this stuff. Um, so the kind of the, the gist of what I'm getting at here is that fuzzy matching over a large data set can be really expensive and that if you're doing any sort of thing with, th if you're looking at census data, for example, there are you know, millions of names in there or millions of, millions of pieces of information or if you're looking at data sets of language, um, it's going to be much, much more efficient for you to generate um, some sort of index that has um, phonetic matches of these things and then query against that. So um, they also tolerate some misspelling, which is great, because if, if your misspelling is phonetically similar to the way the word was intended to be spelled, it's going to get a match. Um, if you're using the right type of phonetic algorithm or something that tolerates that. So um, interesting thing is that spell checkers often use them um, for, uh, to basically do word matches. So, you know, procrastinate. It, I don't know, I actually didn't run it through a spell checker to find out, but Google pretty much figured it out. So they might actually be doing this on the back end. Um, Another thing, I, I was talking to my, my aunt uh, a few weeks ago, and she runs uh, an after-school program in uh, the Berkeley, in Berkeley, California, um, and uh, she has to manage a database with hundreds of family names, and she says, she's, she's like, I can't misspell anything, I have to get the right names, I, it's so difficult to use, I'm like, this, this could solve your problems, <laughs> this would be awesome if somebody thought about that, but. Um, so this is kind of an example of how I use this. I was using Mongo for my uh, lost and found item database. Um, in this case, uh, Arya Stark has lost her ID card. Um, so uh, I'm storing her first name, her last name, um, and then I'm storing the phonetic rest representations of it. And when I implemented the search, I actually just had it do a translation at, at runtime um, that said, you know, whatever they're typing in, do a, uh, uh, run a phonetic algorithm on it, and then look in the database to find out what's a match. Um, so then I could actually do um, fuzzy or partial matching on that, or I could do the exact match of the, the phoneme if I want something more specific. So, um, and I mentioned Elasticsearch before, um, and this was kind of really cool that I, I discovered. It has phonetic matching built in. So uh, Elasticsearch has the concept of um, an index and an analyzer. So you basically store your data in document format. It's NoSQL, sort of. It doesn't necessarily mean schemaless. Um, 
but uh, that's a little out of scope for this talk. But if, you're ha if you want to talk about Elasticsearch, I'll talk your ear off after the talk. Um, uh, so it, it has uh, an 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 basically different analyzers that you can use. There's a library you just install on your Elasticsearch servers um, and like restart it, and then you have all of this um, different language capability, search capability built in. So that's pretty cool. Um, it's an HTTP REST interface, so you basically run queries by throwing an HTTP request at it. And if you have all those different analyzers installed, which you, you would if you installed the, their phonetic package, um, then you can change them on the fly. So if you can say, I didn't return any results with this language, um, maybe I'm looking for the wrong language if you were unfamiliar with something. But um, I, I thought that was pretty neat. I'm looking forward to using it. Um, I haven't actually tested it out yet. So um, caveats for Elasticsearch <laughs> is that um, I, I have a lot of pain from administering Elasticsearch systems. Uh, my recommendations, if you wanted to go use this, were uh, don't store anything in there that you can't easily re-index or re-add. So <laughs> there's, there's a lot of reasons for that, but just be forewarned, it's not really a database. It doesn't have transactions. It doesn't have, you know, uh, data security as, as some other things do. Back up your stuff. Um, so what, do you, what happens if you want to use something that for non-English languages? Um, there are some implementations, but um, generally what I found is that most of them are for English. Um, I saw some in, Ingu in Indian and a lot for uh, Germanic and Slavic languages. Um, so that was, I think, I think I had touched on it on one or two of the slides. Uh, I think there's the deitch mokotov algorithm and Kölner phonetic, I think, are, are for Germanic languages. Um, and then there's a version of uh, Soundex in uh, Python that has, I think it's the, the if you go to uh, PyPI, it's just the SoundX algorithm has, has Indian dialects supported as well. Um, but they're actually pretty simple to write. They're basically a, maybe one to 200 lines of code. It's a rule set. Most of it is, can be done with hash mapping, so you can actually just map um, a certain set of characters to a representation of that. Um, and um, if you have some friends that know linguistics, um, you should uh, basically get them to help you write, write this because it would probably be a lot of fun. I, I know I, I'm going to go out and try and do this because I have a couple friends that um, are linguistically inclined or have studied it and now they also do programming. Um, and it looks like a really fun thing to do. So, but basically the um, outline of what the algorithm does is analyze the first few characters and substitute for common phonemes. Translate middle characters according to the phonemes, account for accounting for accent marks, uh, translate and drop last characters, and then truncate to a shortened version of the word. That's pretty much, they all follow a very similar pattern. So I know there was a lot of words I just threw at you, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, so that's pretty much most of it, what I had to describe this. Um, this is a big research page. I'll, I'll put these slides up online somewhere and then tweet about it so that you guys can look at this stuff later. Um, but uh, I'll, in this last one link on here is a, is a book reference that's for fun. If you like sci-fi and you like linguistics, read this book, it's amazing. Um, and that's my last slide. Thank you for listening. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to chat. So. Thank mm -hmm. you.